Welcome to the Cloud or Not podcast. We are your hosts, Andreas and Michael Winnick. Sorry for that. We have been building on AWS since 2009. Uh, you can follow along uh, as we develop products like um, Bucket AV, uh, Marbot, and HyperEnv, and you can learn from our practice. This is episode number 87, and we are recording this on the last day on February in 2024. So in course you're watching this live on YouTube or LinkedIn, feel free to ask your questions and we will answer them either directly or at the end of the show. So Andreas, um, what are we talking about today? Do you have anything yeah. that you want to share with us? Yes, I have. So Michael, so I have um, recorded a video and published a blog post um, this week. Um, so it is about how to reduce costs with GitHub Actions. So yeah. the thing is, um, I think it was last year, Michael, that we migrated our projects from Code Pipeline to GitHub Actions. Is that right? Yes, uh, I think so. Because we just, so I would say the, the main argument for that was that um, the user experience with GitHub Actions is, is quite good because you have your code and your CI CD pipelines all in the same place. And um, so with code pipeline and GitHub and everything mixed up, it was always quite challenging to get an overview of what's going on there. So that is why we switched. And um, but, but then when we basically had transitioned all our projects uh, to GitHub Actions, we soon noticed that it's, um, it's getting quite expensive actually, <laughs> uh, because when you're using GitHub Actions, and you're using the so-called GitHub hosted runners, so the machines that run your CI CD jobs, uh, then you have to pay, of course, for those runners. Uh, it's by minute. And depending on your GitHub plan, some minutes are included or not, so that depends. So all, all changed a little bit, I think, when Microsoft changed the pricing plans. Um, but yeah, but depending on your uh, plan and the number of minutes you are using, um, GitHub Actions can become quite expensive over time. So I think at the end, when we started to investigating this, we paid uh, a few hundred bucks per month just for our CI CD pipelines. And yes, we have some long running pipelines, but we are only two developers, right? So <laughs> there's not crazy amount of coding going on. So just the two of us. Uh, and so, um, so I thought, and we thought, so how can we reduce our uh, monthly GitHub bill? And um, recently, I found uh, quite an interesting tool from Sandro. Um, so he developed uh, what is called Octolens. So this is a small GitHub, act uh, GitHub uh, application, and it allows you to get insights into your GitHub Actions usage. Because um, all what GitHub is offering is basically offering you the total amount of minutes that you consume, the build minutes. Uh, and you can download a CSV report, which is not that handy, to be honest. So, so the cool thing what, what Sandro is building with Octolens is um, a, a very simple application that you can just install, and then it gives you insights into how much build minutes you're using, and especially important, it shows you which repositories and which workflows consume the most build minutes. So this is a great place um, to look into when you want to start optimizing your workflows. So often there's maybe, I don't know, room for improvement to improve the time it takes to build something. Uh, and you can uh, find those areas where it makes the most sense to, um, to take action. So yeah, Octolens is what I can highly recommend. And I've, uh, as I said, I recorded um, a video. So find it on YouTube in our channel or I've written a blog post where I summarize all of that. So if you're interested into details, check that out. And the other thing is, so back then, when we noticed uh, that we need to find a way to reduce our GitHub Actions costs, um, we also started HyperEnv. So this is our solution to deploy self-hosted uh, GitHub runners on AWS. So instead of using the infrastructure that GitHub provides, you basically bring your own virtual machines. And with HyperEnv, we, we aim to make that as easy as possible to deploy that to your own AWS account. And then the whole thing runs on EC2 machines and HyperEnv just starts EC2 machines on demand. So you're only paying for what you use. The machine is only running for the builds that you are doing. And um, so as a rule of thumb, that is 
by using Hyperend, you can reduce your GitHub uh, action spending by 30% roundabout, uh, including the AWS infrastructure costs, of course. Um, yeah, so those are the two uh, tools that I discussed in the blog post and the video, how you can reduce your GitHub action spending. Yeah, that's great. And Andreas, there's someone in the, uh, on LinkedIn who agrees with your kind of experience of GitHub Actions. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it it's really, I mean, if it's 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 really easy to use and and super easy to if if things go wrong, you it's super easy to find the reason for that. And so, mm. yeah, um, it's a great a great addition to what GitHub offers uh, besides um, um just uh, the pipelines i mean they have i think they still have very great ways of collaborating on code so i like the pull request feature still mm. um so we use it on a daily basis um and yeah uh, it's really uh, one of the tools that we kind of rely on every day andreas right so absolutely yeah and happy customers uh, to be honest yeah uh, and that brings us to our, our next topic, Michael. So because yeah. uh, we have been working on uh, a CI CD pipeline quite a lot during the past uh, week. Um, yeah. So the thing is, uh, so that's a pipeline for bucket AV. So maybe let yeah. me give you an, an introduction and then uh, um, you can mm -hmm. go through the pipeline, how it works in detail. All right. So cool. the thing is, so we are bucket AV is a product that we sell in the AWS marketplace and what we need to do to basically release a new version is we need to provide an Amazon machine image, an AMI, and we need also to provide CloudFormation templates because those two are basically the deliverables um, that we then upload to the AWS marketplace. So that is basically the scenario. And we, this process was more or less manual, but as we are doing it about once a month, we wanted to uh, take action and automate uh, that thing. And that's also because AWS is currently um, adding more and more API calls, allowing you to do that automatically. So we are hoping that uh, also this will be able for AMI and CloudFormation products in the future. It's already uh, available for some of their product types in the marketplace. So that's why we think it's a good time to start working on the automation part. So Michael, can you talk us through how we um, implemented the CI CD pipeline for Bucket AV? Yes, I do. And I wanted to add one kind of motivation for why this was actually uh, also important um, because just the last release that I created for uh, Bucket AV powered by Sophos, I made a mistake. So I copied uh, a wrong, uh, basically, URL for where the CloudFormation template lives. So I submitted the wrong templates to AWS accidentally. I mean, I, I noticed it uh, because we always review them when they create a new release, the release. But this was kind of human error, right? And and this is also, um, I mean, it's something that, that we should kind of uh, optimize uh, and reduce. So that's why uh, we also created this kind of uh, automated approach. One thing to add is that all the pieces that we kind of connected together were already automated. For example, the AMI creation was already automated. Uh, testing was already automated. Basically, what was missing was kind of connecting everything together to kind of create a new release. So. Let me walk you how, uh, through how it works. So one thing to know is that Bucket AV lives in one single Git repository hosted on GitHub. So we have the core product in there. We have what we call add-ons. We also have uh, other things that we use internally. It's all in a single bucket. So to kind of create a new release, what you basically do is you create a Git tag. And then uh, for us, because we have two variants of our product, um, one for Claim AV and one for Sophos, you can, for example, tag the Git repository uh, with the tag claim AV. And what I did in the morning is I created a tag claim AV version 2.18.0. So that will be our next release that I submitted to AWS Marketplace. And then you push that commit up to GitHub. Uh, and um, what happens is that the GitHub action is triggered. And this GitHub actions first runs our um, static uh, analysis. So it, it validates our JavaScript code, it validates our cloud formation templates, it runs the unit tests. So that's kind of the very quick check if everything is kind of in good shape. Um, then it creates uh, the bucket AV executable and it's our application is implemented in Node.js, um, but you can create a binary with Node.js and that's what we basically ship 
um, uh, later uh, into the AMI. That's the next step where we create the AMI. And we use Paco for that. So we add our binary and we add the engine. So either the ClaimAV, uh, ClaimAV engine or the Sophos engine. And we work kind of everything else that we need to make it work. Uh, CloudWatch agent, for example, a couple of configuration files, of course, uh, things like that. We install the latest patches and so on and so forth. And then we generate CloudFormation templates for our product using the CDK. So our templates are, or we use the CDK to kind of implement everything that we need and then we use it to kind of synthesize the CloudFormation templates. So this is kind of, now we have all the pieces in place because the templates require the AMI as an input and we can now kind of spin off BucketDB and that's what we do in an automated way and then we run our integration or acceptance test against this. So this is then really spinning up AWS infrastructure. And we have, I mean, long time ago we started with a, a JUnit um, based project like using the Java language and we adopted that and adopted it and adopted it and we use it in BucketDB as well. So that's why the, the, the acceptance tests are implemented in Java uh, using the JUnit framework. But it, it's really not about the language so much. It's just we create a lot of CloudFormation stacks and then we kind of, um, in for BucketDB case, we upload a file to an N3 bucket and we see if it's, for example, tagged as infected or something like that. So we kind of assert everything that, that, that should happen. Um, that's kind of it. Next step, once that actually is successful, of course, if it fails, we will not continue the pipeline, but once it is successful, uh, we prepare a release for AWS Marketplace. And this requires a couple of things for us. For example, we have to upload the CloudFormation templates to a specific bucket, and we also have to share our AMI with an uh, account from Amazon. So um, copy the AMI to them, basically hand it over. And then unfortunately, the last step that Andreas talked about is then kind of submit this information to AWS Marketplace. And that's not yet um, a part of their API. So they are kind of expanding on that area, but our product type, which is an AMI with CloudFormation, uh, is not yet possible. So basically at this point in time, we just output all the information that we need to then kind of manually, and this is not a joke, um, we have to submit an Excel sheet with, bill and it's not billions, but thousands of, of columns <laughs> and we submit this to AWS Marketplace and then they kind of, I think they kind of import it somewhere and then kind of process our request. So the last step is definitely something that we want to automate as well because here we can make errors, uh, still make errors, um, but uh, we hope that someday um, they release this API and then we can can kind of uh, yeah finish our, our release pipeline here. Yeah. Michael, I want to I want to add one thing. Um, so you talked mm -hmm. about our acceptance test that spin up the CloudFormation mm -hmm. stacks and basically see if uh, the application works as expected. But one aspect that is crucial for us is so we sell the product through the marketplace and our customers install it in the region of their choice. So we need to make sure that our product works in all the regions available. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's why we also spin up a, a test in all of the regions, uh, actually, to make sure the product works there. Because we notice that, um, maybe, we, maybe we'll talk about that a little, a little bit um, in the next section, that the regions um, have small but important differences from time to time. And you cannot rely on a product working every uh, in the same way in every region. So that is why we have to test basically in every region if the product is working. Uh, and that's what we do as well. And the, that's also why the acceptance test takes quite some time <laughs> because we spin up a yeah. lot of different configurations in different regions. And this takes quite some time uh, to get that done. So that's a little um, bummer, but it's the only way to, to be sure that the product will work for all of our customers. And, and if you say quite some time, I think we can be we can be <laughs> fully transparent, right? I mean, it takes it takes three hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. The full the full run takes three hours. Yeah. Um, it is already kind of uh, paralyzed in some ways, but the problem is that we, for example, we use a lot of CloudFormation APIs, and CloudFormation has very tough rate limits, so you cannot send a lot of great stack resources operations. So we can most likely send one per second, mm. and if we if we have eight tests running in parallel, it could be that we create eight stacks in parallel. Um, and then those stacks also make a lot of API calls, right? Like CloudFormation spins up a lot of VPCs then and, and, and auto-scaling mm. groups and alarms. And so it, the problem is that at this point, if we 
increase the parallelization from 8 to 16, for example, our tests will be actually not faster because we, we just run in all these rate limits and everything starts to retry mm. and it's not going faster. What we would, what we have, what we maybe in the future have to do, Andreas, is use multiple AWS accounts mm. or use multiple regions to run everything kind of not only parallelized, but kind of parallelized in, a, in different AWS reach, mm. uh, accounts, account. sorry. Yeah. So kind of to share or not to share the rate limits. Yeah. yeah and but yeah, that's... Yeah, and, and that, it's it's on our list, right? Yeah, another thing is the the quotas. So we have to make sure that we can create yeah. enough VPCs and spin up enough EC2 instances in parallel and stuff like that. So uh, that's also challenging, especially as you run acceptance tests, maybe not only for the release, but also for pull requests or something. Yeah, so that's yeah. that's quite a lot going on there. But yeah, but I think still um, I'm really... Uh, I would say I'm really proud of this automation and the the depth that we go into the the testing, because it it ensures that when we ship a new release, um, we catch um problems in our code before uh, it reaches our customers, and that makes uh, makes really um it's very important for delivering a quality quality um and be a reliable partner for our customers. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm also very proud of the test suite, to be honest, um, and I, I fully rely on it. Uh, so I, I have very high confidence in it. Um, I I know that the feature that I'm working on at the moment uh, will will require me to add a lot of new tests because it involves multiple AWS accounts for cross account activities. Uh, so I have to add a, a couple of more tests, Andreas. So it will be getting <laughs> slower and slower. So maybe we need to think about <laughs> that concept of using multiple accounts to run the... the yeah, so yeah. maybe we have to optimize uh, <laughs> uh, soon. But um, at the moment, it's, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's okay. Yeah. And and we can live with it. Um, so I usually work on two or three features in parallel. So I have always a couple of tests running uh, in parallel. And that's also why our, our GitHub build was so high, right? Because we have really mm. tests that run for three hours and then we run them a couple of regions and then we have nine hours built, mm. uh, basically, that we pay for GitHub and then it, it gets expensive. Yeah, um, that's correct. So, yeah, I think we at one we at, at, at one month we paid a four-digit, like thousand really? something dollars okay. to GitHub. I didn't remember that. Yeah, so okay. it, it definitely made sense for us to optimize there. Mm. I mean, if you, for our company, I mean, we are a small company, it is also a a big part of our monthly spending basically mm. for infrastructure yeah um yeah so there's one question andreas on yeah. on linkedin okay. around um packer versus image builder mm -hmm. and i think you have some expertise in that region right i think i, I don't know if you wrote a blog post about it or i, I would i wouldn't call it expertise but i'm using yeah. a lot of packer so that's for sure so whenever yeah. i need to build amis i'm using packer and in general i like also the the approach of uh, building AMIs um, for for all kinds of uh, workloads. I'm using it, for example, not only for Bucket EV, but for projects where we uh, set up pipelines for, let's call it legacy software that runs on EC2 machines and cannot be easily containerized. So that is when we use Packer a lot. And yeah, Packer is a very flexible tool. So that's what I like about it. It's simple to use. Um, and very flexible. The AWS Image Builder, in contrary, is 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 also a tool to build AMIs. But I think uh, it's not as easy to implement or to integrate it into a CI/CD pipeline. So I think the idea behind Easy to Image Builder is more that you build golden what's what AWS often calls golden AMIs to provide a certain standard AMI for your organization. And it runs um, on its own and it doesn't, I, I don't think, I, I couldn't find a good way to integrate it into a classical CI-CD pipeline as we do it. So it's more if you have the thing just to build your AMI without any repository with code or something in it. So I think that's the main uh, use case for the EC2 image builder. So I would I would accept, uh, expect that um, the image builder is more used for yeah, from ops teams that want to have, I don't know, an Amazon Linux with some pre-installed and configurized uh, stuff, but it's typically not used for building AMIs, including your uh, application, because bundling your application into the AMI is, I think, much easier with Packer than it is with EC2 Image Builder. I could not find <coughs> an easy way to accomplish that. Okay, so if if you have like if our like audience has different kind of experience with it, maybe it changed also over yeah. time. Like, let us know, and maybe yeah. maybe we can kind of revisit it mm -hmm. if if you know that there's something like 
game changing Absolutely. happened in the past. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but basically the reason um, why we use Packers is that because we used it before and it's working and um, it's very well for yeah. us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Um, so let's jump <coughs> to the to the second uh, section of this podcast, which is about um, going over the latest AWS news and seeing your reaction on it. So, <laughs> so I've prepared a few <laughs> news items that I've picked uh, mm-hmm. that I found interesting for some reasons. And I just want to get your um, first reaction on that. Okay, let's go. Okay. So um, the first one is AWS Systems Manager Parameter Store now supports cross-account sharing. So, yeah, I think I can see where this gets useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, you can share secrets or other kinds of parameters with other accounts with your whole organization. It works using the AWS Resource Access Manager. Uh, mm-hmm. So, it's not just a um, resource policy. I think with Secrets Manager, the alternative to the parameter store for uh, mm-hmm. storing secrets, there you have the a resource policy attached to each secret. With with the parameter store, you can share any parameter by using the resource access manager, which is basically its own service that you can that you have to use. Yeah. Um, also, so that makes it a little, I don't know, it's a little more complicated to use. I would say uh, you, you need to set that up, but it works. And then there are a few other requirements I uh, looked into it. So f- I didn't know actually <laughs> that there are two types of parameters in the parameter store. There's the standard parameter and there are advanced parameters. I didn't know about that, Michael. Uh, and the advanced parameters, um, so what they come with, I think it's about um, the rate limit that you can um, access those parameters. And you you pay a little more for the advanced ones. Basically, I think the 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 standard ones are free i, I don't think you pay i, I couldn't find mm-hmm. you i think you, it's basically yeah. just free but the yeah. advanced one you have um five cent per parameter per month and then you're paying for requests as well so that is uh, the difference and you need an advanced parameter to to be able to share it uh you can you can by the way change the type of a um, parameter from standard to advanced if you want to Ah, and another another um, difference between standard and advanced is uh, I think standard is four kilobytes and advanced is eight kilobytes. <laughs> so that's the, the huge benefit of going um, in the other tier. Um, then also important, to sec- if you use a secure string, so basically a secret in the parameter store and you want to share that with another account, you need to use a KMS key, a customer managed KMS key, because then you need to make sure that the other account has access to the key as well. Um, so that mm-hmm. is also important. And yeah, so I think yeah, could be useful. Yeah. I have no concrete use case right now, but from time to time it might be useful to share your parameters with other accounts. Um, yeah. Like I have two kind of one question and one a kind of addition. Like the difference between if you shared using RAM versus you shared with the resource policy is that if you shared via RAM, it really appears in the UI of the other account, mm-hmm. right? It it will be visible just as a parameter there. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least that's how it works for VPC subnets and that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. With a resource policy, you have, like, from the other account's perspective, you don't really know that this secret exists and you have access to it. Like, you have to kind of know it from, yeah. like, outside of your account knowledge, basically. Yeah, okay, good point. Um, mm-hmm. My other question is, I mean, I'm not sure if you know it, Andreas, but how do I access it? Because, I mean, they cannot just use the name, right? I mean, it could be that the parameter name is already taken in my account. So how does this work? Is it prefixed with something, it, or maybe do you, you know that? Do you need the ARN? So where the maybe the account ID is in the ARN, and then you access it by the ARN. Is that possible? Okay, yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. Yeah, but because a lot it. of yeah. like APIs use the the path basically, so there's no good question. No ARN in there, <laughs> so yeah. Good question. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's detailed questions. Sorry mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. No, no problem. <laughs> okay, so next right. next news is AWS Resource Explorer supports sixty five new resource types. That's great. I must admit, I'm not using Resource Explorer <laughs> because it missed so many resources at the beginning. Yes. So I probably will not notice that now 70, 65 new s- uh, resource types are supported. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's, a, it's, that's the it's problem great. with the service. So if it if the coverage is not 100%, the tool is not very useful. Um, and so uh, either they implement all of the resources or they 
can just uh, stop it. So yeah, but yeah, they're they're yeah, doing they some let progress. Let me know when they are done. Like <laughs> yeah. you, they can have a press release. Okay, we now implemented everything. You can now use it. Yeah. So let me know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next one is uh, is also cool. I think the API gateway now supports TLS one dot three. Okay, I think that's kind of what this is actually what Werner all referred to heavy lifting. So I mean, I don't I don't care much. It's nice yeah. that it is added. It was probably a lot of work. Um, and thanks for doing that, yeah. AWS. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a really cool um, example of what it's what it's um, when you use uh, serverless architectures. It, they just optimize over time without much effort uh, on on our side. Yeah. Um, so TLS 1.3, so, so why is it important? So first it's about performance. So um, basically setting up the TLS connection is um, taking less time. And also they have security improvements in there. Uh, for example, also TLS handshakes um, only support uh, ciphers with uh, perfect forward secrecy um, and other 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 things that I don't understand <laughs> are implemented in there. <laughs> yeah, so that's cool. Um, so it's available for all regional REST APIs, HTTP APIs, and WebSocket endpoints. It's not available for private APIs yet. And there's a little um, confusion in the documentation and the, the announcement. So the documentation says it's supported for edge-optimized REST APIs as well. The news doesn't mm -hmm. mention that. The new, uh, so I'm not sure. Okay. But probably the documentation is more accurate here. Yeah, so check that out. So it should be available by, by default. And then the last one, Michael, um, a new AWS region in Mexico is in the works. Yeah, I mean, that's that's always great. Uh, I like it. Um, I mean, I probably will not run the workload there because I, it, probably the latency will be very high from Germany. Mm. But I mean, for our customers, for example, for Bucket AV, it's great if they can run it close to their their workloads, yeah. Yeah. So that. What What did you say? What's the estimated opening date? So um, they plan to open it in early twenty twenty four, uh, twenty five. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so next, yeah, year. next. Year. Okay, one year. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And and by the way, they have five new regions in the works now. So one in more, one more in Germany, Malaysia, Mexico, and New Zealand and Thailand. So that's the five that are currently okay. uh, in the building. So the the German one in the building is this government thing, right? Probably yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so one thing that that um, I was thinking about. So, a challenge is. So we discussed it when we talked about the bucket EV pipeline that there are little differences between the different regions. And for example, services mm -hmm. or features get deployed um, step by step in all those regions. So I was wondering. So how many regions can they add <laughs> until they basically really have a very big challenge for? keeping them in sync and rolling out their features there so that is so 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 yeah. i would I, i'm in, i'm interested in seeing where this will where we will end up in maybe five years so when will they stop adding new regions and then maybe growing them or but that's also not a good yeah. idea probably so it's a really challenging situation actually so um looking looking forward to i mean maybe they hope that in the future not so many new customers will sign up and then the problem goes away so. <laughs> <laughs> don't think so much <laughs> but yeah, yeah. i mean the, it what really is the problem and uh, what we notice like from like a user perspective of aws is that yeah we know regions are different but what also kind of really or it what what's the best way to describe it what what really kind of uh kind of blow my mind is that when they release a new region and then they release a new region a couple of months ago they are different in different ways so for example the the latest region that was released is a canada region mm. say a uh, canada west one or something mm. and for example one of the apis that we use aws marketplace metering api i, I know it's a very niche kind of thing but mm. it's not available there right they, they haven't deployed it there we have never seen that in any other new region that was deployed before mm. it just doesn't exist there <laughs> uh, and this is a new kind of difference compared to all the other region releases mm. and the other one that i talked about before is the there's one like, i don't know how it's called cost optimized whatever strategy for running spot fleets with an auto scanning group and that feature was not there for i think two or three of the latest regions that were released and then a couple of months later it was just there without an, a kind of announcement mm. and so this was kind of the same for all the new regions but this 
the, the API endpoint for the metering API was just missing for the latest region. So I will I will be very excited to see what's missing in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> or so, what kind of new problem they introduced there for us. Yeah. So probably 99% of all AWS customers never noticed that because they are not yeah. using all the regions, of course, uh, and especially not the, the latest ones. Um, so, um, but for us who are really working in all regions, that's that's always yeah. a challenge. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Um, yeah. Is there Let me anything? quickly check yeah. the comments before we close yeah, and that we have not left anything. No, looks good, I think. Uh, I mean, if you missed something, sorry for that. Sometimes LinkedIn doesn't really show them. And, and yeah, then a couple of minutes later, after we kind of close the stream, they pop up. So uh, <laughs> sorry for that. If, if that happens, uh, we will share the email address uh, in a couple of in a couple of seconds. So I think it's okay. time to say goodbye, Andreas. Yeah, perfect. That's it. We'll be back soon. Subscribe to our newsletter, um, the podcast, or the YouTube channel to make sure you're not missing the upcoming shows. And we're looking forward to your feedback. Hello at cloudonout.io or find us on LinkedIn and Mastodon. As always, you will find all the links in the show notes or the video description. Thanks a lot for listening and watching. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.